Welcome to Asian American Life. I'm your host, Ernabel DeMillo. This month, we're at the world famous Pearl River Mart on the border of Chinatown and Tribeca. Pearl River is more than just a store. There's also a gallery and their latest exhibit all started with a hashtag that went viral, hashtag starring John Cho. I'll have more on that exhibit, but first, here's a look at what's ahead. Many Asian Americans are at risk for post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. How can you spot the warning signs? Minnie Rowe has a special report. Rainer Ramirez has local reaction to the terrorist attacks in Sri Lanka. He talked to a New Yorker whose sister was killed. It's been 70 years since the communist revolution in China. Kyung Yoon sat down with journalist and activist Helen Zia about her new book, The Last Boat Out of Shanghai. This and more on Asian American Life. We start our show with a feature on mental health. Here's reporter Minnie Rowe. I'm Minnie Rowe. Post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, is most commonly associated with veterans or soldiers returning from combat. But in reality, anyone who has had trauma can have PTSD. And because of the cultural makeup of Asian Americans, many times the warning signs of PTSD can go undetected. Kadisha Ashgar is a survivor of rape. The perpetrator was a friend who was also a housemate. They sexually assaulted me several times over the course of three months. Um, and so at the sort of final, the completed rape, if you will, um, that's when I developed the PTSD. When the assault happened, she says she felt tremendous shame. I was so shocked at what had happened. My mind like did, couldn't compute it. And as a Muslim Asian, she felt she could not confide in her family. I think trying to, to deal with sexual assault, I think, is really difficult. And for my experience, I think, like, in Muslim communities and in South Asian communities. And I think that there's um, a lot of preconceptions about things like purity and about virginity. Kadisha was already dealing with a traumatic past. Her parents had lived through partition in Pakistan as children. Within a few years of moving to America and starting a family, they both died. Kadisha, along with her sisters, went to live with a maternal uncle who turned out to be emotionally distant and abusive. Growing up in a household in which there was a lot of fear, in which you sort of had to steal yourself before you walked in the door every day, because um, you didn't know what was happening. Um, you know, when there were fights or when there were blowouts, they would sort of just get shoved in a box um, and not talked about. In public, Kadisha was the perfect student. She got good grades, volunteered, and was active in sports. After graduating college, she found a job in public health and continued volunteering with organizations in her community. But her childhood trauma was still there, and once she was raped, it made it almost impossible to engage in her daily life. She was diagnosed with PTSD. Post-traumatic stress disorder is this disorder in which people exhibit many different types of symptoms. So some of them include things like uh, intrusive thoughts, difficulties in concentrating, nightmares, uh, avoidance of certain places, uh, feeling withdrawn. Dr. Kevin Nadal is a leading researcher on the issue of mental health, especially when it comes to people of color, immigrants, women, and LGBTQ individuals. He recently published a book that studies how microaggressions or subtle forms of discrimination can trigger PTSD. Each of those ethnic groups comes with uh, unique histories of war, of colonialism, of violence. Uh, many of those ethnic groups are uh, from countries where they had to escape torture and they became refugees. Uh, and then as a group, Asian Americans also experience uh, discrimination and oppression. So for example, uh, you know, with the Chinese Exclusion Act or uh, the Filipino farm workers who experience brutality or, uh, you know, just uh, 
hate crimes that people experience here uh, in the United States. According to Mental Health America, the nation's leading nonprofit in the field, the number of Asian Americans who seek treatment for mental illness is low as compared to non-Asians, but they have higher rates of suicide and suicidal thoughts. Dr. Nadel says this stems from language barriers that prevent one from finding adequate professional help to the cultural stigma associated with mental illness that still exists within this community. We're often taught to ignore uh, any symptoms of mental health uh, or negative mental health. We're taught to not talk about our problems. We're taught to be strong. We're taught to, uh, to overcome things. So when you have those two things coming together in which people experience trauma as a result of uh, their families or their ethnic groups or their communities, and then um, you come from a community in which uh, you're not taught how to deal with those traumas, uh, this is where some of the PTSD symptoms uh, might manifest. Dr. Nadel also points out a key difference between Asians and other ethnic groups that have experienced similar trauma, like the Jewish and the Holocaust, is that they are less inhibited about sharing the atrocities, using it as a means to educate the next generation and to heal their wounds. Most Asian Americans that I've worked with or have researched um, don't talk with their parents about their parents' experiences with war in their home country, with their parents' experiences uh, with violence within their own families, their parents' experiences of discrimination. Um, it's something that just gets swept under the rug um, and that uh, people might know exist, um, but that it isn't uh, spoken about. And with the current mood across the nation, where microaggressions have become all too commonplace against immigrants and minorities, these overt acts of discrimination can also trigger the symptoms of PTSD. Some psychologists have mentioned this notion of a post-Trump stress disorder. People are being deported um, from our country and that people and children are being treated in inhumane ways that might remind them of the ways that their family had immigrated here and uh, some of the atrocities that their own families had experienced uh, in escaping uh, different uh, horrible situations. I'm just really happy to see so many people in Kadisha is now a Ph.D. candidate at Johns Hopkins University, researching violence against women and children. She has been in therapy for years to manage her PTSD symptoms. But even now, feelings of hopelessness, common for survivors, threaten to overshadow her personal and professional life. Sometimes one, one foot is stuck in the, is in the past. So it can feel hard to bring the other foot into the future or bring both feet into the future when you have one foot kind of always reminding you of the past. My hope is that one day I won't feel frustrated at all by it. <laughs> Within the AAPI community, Southeast Asians are at a higher risk for PTSD because of associated trauma experienced before and after immigration. According to the U.S. Health and Human Services, 70 percent of Southeast Asian refugees who are seeking mental health care have PTSD. I'm Minnie Rowe for Asian American Life. In the wake of the deadly terrorist attacks in Sri Lanka, the Sri Lankan American community here in Staten Island, the largest in the nation, united in support of the people in their homeland. A.J. Subabantita's sister, Chandrani Bandara, like many Buddhists in Sri Lanka's capital, Colombo, was attending St. Anthony's Church on Easter Sunday when the bombs went off. What I heard was that her spinal cord was twisted and she was unconscious. But after one week in a coma, Chandari passed away. I'm angry. Evidence emerged that the Sri Lankan government ignored warnings about the terrorist attacks that killed more than 250 people at three churches and three hotels in the capital of Colombo. A couple of hundreds of innocent people died as a result of ignorance of the authority. When I found that, it was very devastating. Julia VJ Singer heard the news just before dawn that Easter Sunday. The first thing that came up to everybody's mind is contacting their family members, wondering where they're at. And as the news broke out about the bombings, Julia and AJ, along with the greater Sri Lankan community, mourned the senseless tragedy that had struck their homeland. 
all Sri Lankans, uh, uh, Hindus, uh, Tamils, Muslims, and Sinhalis, all all of them are together here, yeah. and praying for all you know the victims. Julia opened the first Sri Lankan art and cultural museum last year. The museum celebrates Sri Lanka's diversity and different faiths. Even though our religious background is quite different, um, all of our religious, you know, sayings are quite similar. We participate in Tamil occasions, or how we participate in, you know, Muslim occasion. We're like Ramadan. Like I'll go over to my friend's house who's having Ramadan, and we would celebrate together. So, like the unity there is, it's quite beautiful. How Staten Island became home to the largest concentration of Sri Lankans in the United States is a bit of a mystery. Ask anyone, they have no clue. Like, literally, because like a lot of the Sri Lankan people, they just came to Staten Island. They like to connect each other and like help each other. So what they do is like, oh, I live in the island. You know what? The better place to stay is in the island because I live here. <laughs> Why do you think Sri Lankans settled here in Staten Island? It's because of that first person or the first family, the, their relatives, their friends came here. And then their friends and relatives came here. This is how it grew up. I wanted to find the pioneer who left the island country of Sri Lanka in the Indian Ocean for New York City's southernmost borough. Narosha Pramasiri had some answers. Narosha. One of the biggest Sri Lanka communities is located here in Staten Island yes. because why? Um, so my grandmother's brother was one of the first uh, Sri Lankans to actually settle in Staten Island. Leslie Gunaratna was part of a new wave of Asian immigrants who came to the United States after President Lyndon Johnson signed the 1965 Immigration Act, which lifted the discrimination against non-European immigrants. With my signature, this system is abolished. We can now believe that it will never again shatter the gate to the American nation with the twin barriers of prejudice and privilege. With the U.S. opening its borders for Asian immigrants, Leslie Gunaratna arrived in New York City in 1968. I called Leslie Gunaratna in Houston to ask him one pressing question. Why did you choose to move to Staten Island? And I simply fell in love with uh, Staten Island. It was quiet, calm, not overpopulated, not too many people, and not even too, ma too much traffic. Leslie says the island was affordable, and downtown Manhattan, where he worked, was just a short ferry ride away. Soon, his siblings were here too. I didn't know that I was starting something. I was only trying to help my immediate family, you know, and the blood relatives. That's about it. Uh, and the people who were uh, connected to my family through marriage. That was all I was trying to do. I was not trying to build anything uh, to last 50 years or anything. I had no idea what I was doing. Today, Staten Island is home to more than 5,000 Sri Lankan Americans. Baseball diamonds are next to cricket pitches. The Buddhist temple serves as an anchor for the community. We shouldn't be running away from Sri Lanka, but, you know, lending an extra hand. Julia says she and her mother are returning to Sri Lanka this month to help with the recovery process. For Asian American Life, I'm Rainer Ramirez. I'm Kyung Yoon. This year marks the 70th anniversary of the Communist Revolution in China. Now a new book by the award-winning author and activist Helen Zia brings to life some of the untold stories of refugees who fled Shanghai in 1949. Helen Zia says she grew up hearing her mother and her aunt say they were on the last boat out of Shanghai. But as she grew older and heard from so many others that their father, their sister, their grandparents had all been on that last boat, she realized that it was really more a mirror to the state of mind of desperate refugees. What it speaks to is the sense of panic. You know, the sense that if I don't get on this one, we're gonna die, my children are gonna die, and I have to get on this. 
Zia's is the first English language book to document the story of the Chinese who fled Shanghai through their own eyes during the chaos and turmoil of the communist revolution. Ironically, there are many books about the expats, the foreigners who lived in Shanghai and fled, but none about the Chinese themselves, the six million Chinese. And so I wanted to find people to tell the story. Zia weaves the true stories of four young refugees as each makes the heart-wrenching decision to abandon their homeland for an uncertain future. One of the refugees profiled in the book is Zia's own mother, Bing Wu, who had never shared her story with anyone, even her own daughter, until much later in her life. When my mother was in her 70s, she had never told me anything about her growing up, and I, as a child, would say, can you tell me something, Mom, about your childhood in China? And she would just always say, that was wartime, it's a bad memory. And that would be it, and it was like there was nothing to say. And after a while, as a kid, you stop asking. And it wasn't until I was in my 50s, and uh, I was having dinner with my mom, and I just said, gee, Mom, too bad you can't tell me anything about your childhood. And she stopped and said, all right, you want to know, I'll tell you. What poured out from her mother was a heartbreaking tale that started with being abandoned by her father when she was six years old because her family was too poor to keep her. Soon Baba called for her and told her to stand beside him. The shopkeepers looked into her mouth and squeezed her thin arms. When they were finished poking and prodding her, one of them took her hand and led her to another room. As she turned to look for her father, she saw his back as he headed out the door. Baba, Baba, she had shouted after him. He didn't turn around. Baba, come back, she cried. How could he leave without her? The stranger gently pushed her into a small, dark storeroom and locked the door. It was the beginning of a life of dislocation for Bing, who persevered and eventually fled to America in 1949 when she was just 20 years old. Zia says learning her mother's refugee story gave her a whole new appreciation for the struggles facing migrants today. They're walking a thousand miles with their babies in arm to be tear gassed at the U.S. border, or they're getting on a rubber raft with their children in rough seas from Somalia or Syria, and they're putting their families at risk only because they're pretty sure they're not gonna, their children are not going to live beyond childhood if they stay. Zia says she hopes her book will help Americans to learn why welcoming migrants and refugees has historically been good for the country. These are the people who go through tremendous sacrifice to end up somewhere in a place that if they are welcomed, if they are allowed to be there and raise their families, they're going to be the most dedicated to creating a family where their kids can accomplish something that they were never able to do. The idea that immigrants and migrants and refugees bring nothing but trouble and crime and disorder to a country is ridiculous. America is a nation mainly of immigrants. Everybody comes from somewhere else, and really it's immigrants and migrants who make America great. Helen Zia was born in Newark, New Jersey, and attended Princeton University, graduating in 1973 as a member of Princeton's first class of women. In college, she co-founded the Asian American Students Association and was an outspoken feminist and anti-war activist. In 1982, Zia was a budding journalist in Detroit, Michigan, when a Chinese-American, Vincent Chin, was beaten to death with a baseball bat by two white auto workers who blamed the Japanese auto industry for taking away their jobs. When a judge sentenced the two admitted killers to just three years of probation and a small fine with no jail time, it was Helen Zia who led the Asian-American community to demand justice for Vincent Chin. I thought for a moment, should I raise my hand? But then it's like, you know what? That could be me next time, or that could be my brother, you know, or somebody I know getting their head bashed in, and it will be okay if we don't speak up. We'll make it seem like it's okay with us. So um, anybody in that situation has a choice of saying, do I speak up 
or don't I? And Zia has continued throughout her career to speak up as an activist, journalist, and author, not only finding the stories of those who are invisible, but making the human and universal connections between them. You know, the stories of refugees and migrants at any time are the same, and maybe we can learn from them so we don't subject people to the pain that my mother went through to have to hide a story for 70 years because she was afraid to tell us. And I think it was a, a huge gift that she gave to me to tell me these stories and, um, and then got me to think, well, what was the context of why that happened to my mother? And got her on the last boat out of Shanghai. And who else was affected by that? And Helen Zia says it took her 12 years of researching, interviewing, and writing Last Boat Out of Shanghai. Her mother didn't live to see her finish the project, but her voice lives on through this important book. I'm Kyung Yoon for Asian American Life. He was the first person of color to win a Tony Award for Best Costume Design of a Play. Clint Ramos has designed sets and costumes for over 100 shows. The multiple award-winning Filipino-American designer recently sat down with Patrick Pacheco, host of CUNY TV's Theater, All the Moving Parts, to talk about his career in showbiz. In the over 200 productions that you've designed, mm. you mentioned that something that binds them all together is that you look for an emotional anchor, mm. something that tethers you to the production or to the play or whatever, and you can become obsessed about it. Mm. What was the emotional anchor for Eclipsed? The emotional anchor that I look for really it has to do with my identity um, and has to do with my experience. And I think for Eclipse, and I think for most of the projects that I do, but specifically for Eclipse, the anchor that I was trying to find was this idea of home. Part of this emotional search for me and, and part of why I am in the theater is really about finding that home. But in, in finding that home, I've realized that a lot of how I identify and how a, a lot of how I form my relationship to things is because I am an outsider and I always feel that and um, uh, there was a period in my life where I didn't acknowledge that and now I sort of deploy that to my advantage. And I think, you know, I, it brings me to tears sometimes when I watch something so completely mundane, uh, you know, uh, and I can almost um, identify those things in the everyday, the way people hold hands, the way people look at each other's eyes. I think, I would like to think that I actually notice those more because I'm an outsider from a culture. You had found a home, yeah, uh, a refuge in the theater from some of the darkest hours that you had spent. Mm. What did you mean? What were those dark hours? I think Part of being an outsider uh, takes a toll on you emotionally. If it wasn't for the theater, I don't think I'll actually be alive. You know, I, mm. I think the people in the theater and the idea of working in the theater has truly saved me. And Ramos recently won an Obie Award for set design for the public theater's recent production of Wild Goose Dream. Diversity in Hollywood is a hot topic and one that we've tackled on our show. It is also the theme of the latest exhibit here at Pearl River Mart's gallery. Hashtag starring John Cho, the call for an Asian American lead. With a hashtag and some creative photoshopping, a social media protest was born. Hashtag starring John Cho imagines what it would be like if the Korean American actor John Cho starred in some of Hollywood's most famous movies from romantic lead to superhero. William Yu, a screenwriter and digital strategist, came up with the idea back in 2016 to advocate for more Asian Americans to be cast in leading roles and also to call out Hollywood's whitewashing of Asian characters. Yu's campaign, which focused on actor Cho, best known as Harold in Harold and Kumar, hit a chord and went viral with over a billion impressions. We were chatting and I spoke to him and I said, have you ever printed out the posters and mounted them um, so that people could really feel that physical um, feeling of seeing an Asian American lead actor? And he had it, which I was, uh, I was very excited about. Um, so we made a plan um, for him to um, have an exhibition here at Pearl River. 
It's fitting that an exhibit born out of a social media protest is making its debut at Pearl River Mart in New York. The store opened as a political statement in 1971, during a tense time in China and U.S. relations. Quan's father-in-law wanted to have a friendship store to introduce Chinese goods to their New York City neighbors. The store has always been more than a store. It's been a community space. It's been a place where um, recent immigrants from Asia can feel a little bit of home. Um, and it's also always been um, a welcoming environment for people who are not familiar with Asian culture um, to come and experience something new, to learn something. And a gallery was a perfect extension of that, where every six to eight weeks you can find and learn something new. As for Cho, maybe the viral hashtag worked. Soon after, he starred as the lead in the thriller Searching, which went on to make $75 million. The exhibit will be up until July. For more information, be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Asian American Life. I'm Ernabel DeMillo. We'll see you next time.